Hey, Israel, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you for I'm, having me. I'm great and I'm excited because for anyone that knows me and listens to this show, I've got to, I've got to declare it. Me and you, we've worked with a lot of the same people. And people have mentioned our names to each other. And then we ended up having that conversation, even bumped into each other in a hotel in, um, you know, um, like Laguna San Beach, Diego. Right? Yeah, Laguna Beach. Yeah. Now, here's the funny thing. If you met someone, how would you explain what you do? Oh, my God. I have this problem <laughs> every single day. I, I Listen, you have the same problem, right? Um, uh, you, yeah, but you come from a different angle. So, you I, know, I guess in short, I guess in short, um, at, at the core of what I do is I, I try to make uh, meaningful introductions between great people and great ideas. Um, everything I do, I try, you know, I, I would like for there to be meaning and purpose to those introductions, not just money is not my motivator. And I know the same is for you. Uh, if we could do amazing things by connecting great people and great ideas, that's that's really where I thrive. Um, but but ultimately, what I guess I've become is, is just the guy people call when you need anything done that a normal person can't get done. Uh, and, and the way you and I connected, I don't know if you remember, but three different people bought me your book and sent it to my house <laughs> until I finally read it and said, what's the deal? And every guy said, we're reading this book and we're hearing your voice. Do you know this guy? And I said, no, but I'm about to. Um, and, and that's when I reached out to you. So, um, yeah. Because you've only got you've only got to look on like LinkedIn or something like that, and and you'll be sat there chatting with us. Sure. And uh, you know, the other day, me and you were communicating, talking about Bocelli and Veronica Bocelli, and you've got all these names, but you've made sure, and you're being very humble about it. You make sure those connect connections satisfy people's you know lust for the celebrity world, but you also make sure that they have a great impact on charities. Yeah. So. Yeah. What was so important? I want to know the small Israel that decided, hey, it needs to benefit someone else. What was the click in that? So before we get into that, what was the young Israel and how did he become so well connected with the celebrity world? That's a good question. And I don't know if I know the answer, but I will tell you where I grew up, which which really is, is the basis and the foundation of, of who I have become, and obviously every day I try to become a better version of myself than I was the day before. My dad is an Orthodox rabbi, and I'm one of nine children. And um, my dad is, he doesn't have a congregation. He doesn't have a, a center. He's a he's an internationally known and, and very well-respected rabbi. And as a result, there were two things that happened growing up. One was as children, we got to travel the world with my parents. So every time anyone in the world wanted my dad to come and I, you know, and any of the kids were below a certain age, we went along. So we got to have all kinds of amazing experiences and we got to see the world as young children, number one. Number two, we also got to meet all kinds of interesting people. Uh, but but more importantly than, than meeting people and having these experiences is seeing the way in which my father interacted with these people. It didn't make any difference if someone was famous or not famous or rich or not rich. Everyone got treated with the same respect. And I think a lot of the kind of hesitation or fear that people have in dealing with whether it be a, you know, a big philanthropist or a very wealthy person or a celebrity is they feel for you know, some reason they feel scared. They feel intimidated, like, oh, I, I can't talk to them. But as a kid, we grew up like people are people and you could talk to anybody and, you know. Um, so that was that. And then, um, and also growing up in the home we grew up in, my parents' home was people were dropping in till two o'clock in the morning every single night with all kinds of needs. And my parents' home was one that was always open and very, we, we were raised in a house where community was very important and, and you had to do whatever you were, you had to use whatever you were blessed with and whatever you had and whatever you knew to help the community around you. And, and you know, all of my siblings, we live all over the world now and everybody's married and everyone has their own kids, but everybody has really established themselves as community leaders and doers wherever they are with whatever they're passionate about. And that really came from the upbringing we have. So as a little kid and already when I was a teenager, I was putting together fundraisers for charities that I felt 
I liked, that I connected with. I was doing concerts. I was doing galas. I was doing auctions. I was doing all kinds of things. So by the time I, I, I actually met my wife at one of the fundraising events that I produced in Israel for a charity that I helped start, uh, that's where we met. So uh, I guess that was me as a little kid, just, just connecting people and good causes and, and doing cool things. Never did it as a business. Um, before I was married, I had already raised $50 million for charities that I, you know, had an affinity towards and felt close with just for fun, just cause I can, why not? Uh, and then from there, eventually not planned and not anything I ever expected that I'd get myself into, but we now have a business, uh, that we started in 2009. Uh, essentially what we do is we design unique trips and experiences and uh, offer them on consignment to charities all over the world. Uh, and then when COVID hit, that, that was a whole new uh, trajectory for our business. But that's, 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 the, that's the short of where this all started. Now, I can understand a lot of your enthusiasm and your appeal to do good would have come from your father. But do you think also a lot of part, uh, a great part of your um, cultural growth came from the travel. The Absolutely. fact that you traveled so much. Absolutely. And not only that, I'm also a very adventurous person. I like to push the limits. And, and even when we traveled or even when we saw experiences that the ordinary person would experience if they called any travel agent, I was always like looking for the angle of how do we do this different? How do we do this better? How do, you know, so I'll, I'll give you an example. We went with the family to um, to Florence for a vacation. So we went for a week and, uh, someone said to us, there's this old silk factory in Florence. They make handmade, they have machines that were designed by Leonardo da Vinci. These machines originally were owned by the noble families in Florence. Each family had one of these machines to make high end silks and fabrics. And at a certain point, these families got together and pooled the machines and they made this factory where they manufacture these high-end cells and fabrics. And then wouldn't it be cool if you could get a tour? So I made a couple of calls and we got a tour. And when we finished going through the tour, it was fascinating. It was amazing. We finished going through the tour, which I presume if anyone knows about it, they could probably arrange the tour themselves. Um, the factory is now owned, it was owned by the Pucci family and they sold it to Stefano Ricci. So at the end of the tour, I asked the girl who's giving us the tour, could I buy some fabrics? And she's kind of like chuckling. She says, I, you can't just buy fabrics. You know, we get an order from the Kremlin. We get an order from Buckingham Palace of a 40 foot wall by, by 20 feet. Then you need a wallpaper and that's what we make. I said, you have no fabric. She said, what do you want to do with it? I said, I don't know, make a tie. She said, oh, for that, you know, we have, we have rolls. You could buy some stuff. But what are you going to do with it? I said, didn't you say Stefano Ricci owns the company? She said, yeah. I said, so why can't he make me a tie? She says, he's not going to make you a tie. I said, did you ask him? I said, I'm not asking him. He owns the freaking company. He's one of the biggest designers in the world. I said, okay, I'll buy the fabric and I'll ask him. She said, do you know him? I said, no, but before I leave Florence, I will know him. Um, I called Veronica, right, ironically, yeah, yeah. our mutual friend, Veronica Bocelli. And I said, hey, are you friends with Stefano Ricci? Of course. He's one of our closest friends. I said, is he around? <laughs> he's not. He's back on Thursday. What do you need? I said, I want to meet with him. She says, great. Thursday, he's going to meet you in the flagship store. And I sat down with him. I told him what I do. I told him what I asked. He says, you're going to pay for the tie? I said, yeah. He says, so why wouldn't I make it? So now <laughs> one of the experiences we offer is to go, you know, and he kicked it up a notch. So now you could go to that factory. You could go to the manufacturing facility where Stefano Ricci makes his stuff. You can meet Stefano Ricci in the flagship store. He'll custom make your clothing head to toe. But you know, this was always the type of kid I was, like just very curious, adventurous, trying to find a new angle to every experience we had. So we, we've had a lot of experiences and traveling the world definitely helped, you know, set the foundation for what I do today. But but I think that that sort of personality helps as well. Now, do you think people are losing that element of, because let's be serious, there's people like me, you in the world that uh, we're, we're there to have someone's creativity outsourced to us. Um, we're the ones that think up these amazing experiences. Why are people so scared of actually thinking about it themselves? Because you did, and, and I've actually done a speech on this, uh, and you know the classic, you know, Bocelli playing at yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. feet of Michelangelo's sure. David. Um, one of the stories that I talk about when I'm on stage is I got it because I asked. And 
you did the ex you literally just said it in its simplest form you got the time made because you dared to ask why do you think so many people are scared to actually do that now i'll tell you uh, you know a lot of our clients are very successful uh you know uh, business people and they are very used to being in charge of everything going on and as a result of them being in charge they make all the decisions the buck stops with them and whatever they want to do they make the decision they want to do and the second they have any sort of fear that someone may say no they'd rather pay someone else to ask the question for them in the in the rare chance that someone says no to them and i really believe that that's what our that i, I mean we get a tremendous amount of business from people like that. I'll tell you a crazy story. And this is actually how I, how I became closer with Elton John. There was, he was, he had a show this summer in LA. He was part of the iHeart radio. He got a, the icon award at the iHeart awards. Right. Yeah. And I get a call from the girlfriend of a very big internationally renowned artist who was also part of the show. And she says, I need to ask you a huge favor. Are you going to be at the show tonight? And I said, yeah. She says, I got to ask you a favor. Do you think if we brought our baby that you could get us to, to, to meet Elton John with the baby? All I want is a picture of my baby with Elton John. And we have Elton John sunglasses for the baby. And we just, I want that picture so that when the baby grows up, she'll, re she'll know one day that she had this amazing opportunity. And I said, sure. And she said, are you sure? He said, of course, right? So she thinks till this day, I did the world's biggest favor. What did I do? I did the exact same thing that this artist should have done and the same thing she would have done. I knocked on Elton's dressing room door and I said, so-and-so is here tonight and he's here with his baby. And when it's good for you, he'd love to bring the baby over and say hello. I, I didn't do anything. It's just, here's a person who is either afraid of rejection or thought maybe it's stepping out of line to ask. But if I'm asking on your behalf, why the heck wouldn't I? Right? Now, I never prepped you with any of these questions because I, I wanted to just have the conversation with you. But I've repeated exactly what you've just said. I think in today's society, the higher the profile you become, the more what appears to be in control or in power you have, the more intimidated you get of being declined. And yep. people are scared. Two things happen. You're either scared of being turned down or you're scared of them asking you for a reciprocating favor. And favors from some people can escalate faster than any kind of mafia loan will. And yeah. you could have got someone backstage one day and the next minute they're asking for your firstborn. So it's a really strange, strange time. I'm wondering if it's society, society that we're in now that is making us a little bit more scared to actually ask for things. Uh, it could be. I just think, I mean, it's interesting because we're also living at the most selfish time in history, probably. I think people are more selfish now than they've ever been. But at the same time, I think social media gives a lot of people the, the opportunity or the platform to make pretend or to project that they're a lot more secure than they are. And at the end of the day, a lot of these people, as successful as they are in business, deep deep inside are just scared, insecure people who either worked hard or got lucky, but there's, there's real insecurities out there with people who you would never expect it from. Uh, and, and, and I think that's where I wouldn't say you and I, people like you and I take advantage of it, but that's where our value comes into these people, right? Here's a yeah. person who, who could do this for me. Let, let them, let them handle it. And, and I'll get involved when I have to. It's a strange, you're right. It's a strange thing where so many people now visually like they look like they've got everything together and yeah. inside it's a whole different story. Um, we recently just lost the drama of the Foo Fighters through drug addiction. You know, a real fun, admired band that's like respected and loved all over the planet from, from kids to rockers. The Foo Fighters did a great job of crossing this heavy metal to college frat music. They did a great job of, of gathering all of those different genres there. And you think they've got everything together and then you, you, you lose a member because of that. And I'm going to bring it up. We saw Will Smith break down 
a couple of days ago, something happened where, let's be blunt, either side of the train you are, he he, he lost control for a second. Um, and sadly for him, he lost control. As we all lose control, sadly for him, he lost control when the whole world was watching him. And that's, oh, that's, that's very yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, and I'm 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 we we're, we're now just sitting here watching the story and seeing how it's going to get played out, but it's it's just a shame where that that is actually happening now. Well, let's talk about the celebrities for a second. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that still focus on, oh, I really want to meet a celebrity, and and, and we're talking now about the insecurities. We're mm -hmm. talking about you know the, the 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 people inside the celebrity shield. If you wanted to connect with a celebrity, and me and you get it, and I always joke about how many friends I suddenly get around award season, you know? Yeah, you hear people come out of the woodworks. Oh, this week, it... you must be, your phone must be blowing up this week between the, my the Oscars and the Grammys. Oh, yeah. yeah. So my, te my te I'll, I'll, I could be accurate. So I don't keep texts. You know, once I finish the conversation, I delete it off of my phone. So I usually keep three texts on there, my wife, my son, and my family chat. Okay. And by and the, the way, others... that's, that's what I respect about you most. And I should have led with this. I read your book. It's awesome. I watch your content online. It's awesome. There's a lot to learn from a guy like you. But, but the most impressive is a guy who puts his family first. And unfortunately, in today's society, that's not something that's very common either. So I, I respect that a lot more than anything you've ever accomplished. A family man is someone who deserves a lot of respect today. So I sorry I didn't start that. with that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I try. I don't think I'm good at it. And yeah, I, think I saw you with your son in the it. hotel. I, I, I saw it right away. Yeah, yeah he's uh, he, special. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, you kind of throw me off my curve now. I'm all, I'm all kind of like humbled now. Um, I was saying that I had the, I have these three text stories on my phone. 117 new texts came in Thursday to Saturday morning because of Oscar weekend. Yeah. And now I'm starting to get the ones for the Grammys. So it's it's a it's a funny old period. But if people are out there, and me and you both get it, and we get the, hey, 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 you know, I, I want to meet so-and-so. What's the basic fundamental steps that you tell people to do? Because I get a lot of sob stories. I also get a lot of people saying, hey, I want them to wear my T-shirt. What would be the steps that you would suggest someone to make in order to make a connection with a celebrity so so first of all is authenticity is is a must i i asked all the time could you get my product to so-and-so could you get my clothing brand to so-and-so my answer is always no if i don't believe in your product and i don't believe in you and i don't see a reason to do it i'm not doing it if i i don't care that your spoiled brat 16 year old daughter is is obsessed with justin bieber and having a birthday party tomorrow I, that's not something i'm doing what i what i do all the time and what i'm sure you've done plenty of uh my passion has been since the time i'm a kid i'm very involved in children's hospitals around the world and children organization around the world if there's a sick kid who wants something and it will give them the fight you know the the courage and the fight to keep going that that's where i'll i'll turn the world on its head Actually, I have a great story about about Will Smith and that. I don't know if, if you want to hear it, but yeah, um, I, we so do. the first thing is authenticity. You know, I tell people all the time, and I think it's 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 embroidered under every collar of every jacket that I have in my suits and my blazers. Integrity is currency. People could sniff through BS, and people well in one second, anyone today could tell if you have an agenda. And if you have an agenda, I want nothing to do with you. That's number one. Number two. What's the purpose? And even a lot of people who've offered good money, I want to go backstage and meet so-and-so. My first question is always, why? Right? Yes. Yes. Why? <laughs> why? What, do you, what, what, what are you trying to achieve? Is it going to make you a better person? Is it going to make you a stronger person? Like, why? What is this? What's the purpose of the meeting? And very often, with a lot of the experiences that we put together for people, it started with just a grain, a little kernel of something that they've always dreamed of doing, but they never really flushed out the whole vision. Okay, so I get at the core of it, I get what you're looking for, but what's the purpose of it? And, and how is that an experience? Going backstage and taking a selfie with someone is not an experience, that's not a memory. That's, that's something you're gonna put on social media on show off. And, and by next week, 
your 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 ego is telling you I, I need more of that. It's like, you know, it's like it's like drugs. I need more. I need another picture. I need I I want purpose. I want meaning. I want uh, so uh, you know, the first step to to getting to the celebrity is be real. And if you're not real, they're going to smell it in a second. And even if they don't smell in a second, it will take them maybe 2 seconds to figure it out and then you're out. These people have very small and tight circles and people are coming and going very quickly as I'm sure you know. And in order to establish a real, true friendship and relationship with anyone, not just celebrities, this is with anyone, you have to, they have to know and believe that you're real and you're authentic and you're not here to use them and you're not here to take advantage of them. You're either real friends with them or you're not. And that's, that's essentially the, at the core of making, developing, developing meaningful relationships with anybody. It doesn't matter who they are. I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does. Um, we're also, and actually, it, it segments very nicely or connects very nicely to what we were saying about how insecure people are today. People are very wary, and people in power and profile <clears throat> are treble wary because they know they're always being asked for something. So they're always on guard. If you can be transparent, authentic, and show up and go, hey, this is what I'm looking for, and here's my why. Then you cut through all of that. They're already wary about you. Yeah. Anyone walking up to a celebrity, the celebrity's always, oh God, what does this person want? So they're already on their back heel. So if you can actually get rid of that straight away by showing full authenticity of who you are, what you stand for, and why you are in that face, you, you, you stand a better chance of actually getting through. As, as you know, I mean, <clears throat> I have a lot of amazing relationships, right? with a lot of incredible artists and athletes and, and, and celebrities, and all kinds of people like that. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever had a conversation with a musician about their music or their albums no. or an actor about their movies. That's everyone talks to them about it. Everyone tells them all day how amazing they are. I don't even watch half these movies. I don't even listen to half this music. To me, I'm interested in knowing, and, and I think they open up quicker when they realize you're a family man and you have values and you're asking me about, you know, my, uh, my outlook on life. You're asking me about my children. You're asking me about my family. Like these are things very near and dear to people, but they don't usually get the chance to open up to people and talk about that. And when you give them that opportunity and when you talk to them about spirituality and meaning and purpose and, you know, what do you think your purpose is in this world? It's like it catches them off guard. But once they're in that conversation, you're locked in and you're 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 running at a different you know you're you're in a different space than anybody else in their life because you're having very different conversations with them and they're remembering it and i yeah. think that's 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 probably another very important factor Stop, don't don't fangirl or fanboy over them talk to them about real stuff they're real people at the end of the day and they want to be treated as such i remember i was stood with a celebrity once i can't even remember who he was but he was an actor um he was he was successful um and someone came up to him and just blurted out going oh i really loved you in this and i really loved you in that and you were wonderful on this and after the person had just basically gushed and left he turned around and he said something about i just met a Wikipedia page what a bore and that was it you know he had no conversation he was yeah. literally just given his resume in front of him and there was no connection so yeah. it was kind of a daft thing. You said you had a Will Smith story for us. I think everyone needs a Will Smith story at the moment. So give it to us. Um, yeah. So so that when I saw the title of your podcast is, uh, uh, what is it? Making Things Happen? The Art of Making Things Happen. The Art of Making happen. Things Happen. And then I, I saw a reminder in my calendar that I'm going to be on the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And then I'm watching the news and seeing Will Smith. I go, hey. <laughs> so, uh, as I told you before, I'm very involved with a lot of uh, organizations that deal with, you know, pediatric illness. And one of them in particular is the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto and an organization called High Lifeline. They help kids with cancer, their families, beautiful stuff they do. So, you know, throughout the whole year, I fulfill, I grant wishes, I guess. Not that I'm make a wish, but you get the idea. Yeah. So a, kid, a kid wants this, a kid wants that, a parent wants this. So whenever I can, if I have the opportunity, I set up all these types of things for them. Uh, every summer, inevitably, because we live in Toronto, Drake has his OVO Music Fest, which right. is a big deal. And yep. these kids, you know, Toronto kids, no matter who they are, they want to be there. And so, yeah. so it became a tradition for about five summers. We got a stretch limo. We took a bunch of kids with cancer, teenage kids. We would take them out to dinner. 
pick them up in a limo, take them to the concert, sit in one of the front rows. And then after the show, we'd take them backstage to meet Drake. So it's another summer, probably four or five years into this. Let me just backtrack. The day before the OBO Fest, I, uh, Will Smith was here filming Suicide Squad. And I took a different group of kids to visit him on set and to visit the set of Suicide Squad. So the next night, we take these kids to the concert. And about four or five hours before the concert, I get a text from, I don't know who it was. I don't even remember. Someone on Drake's team, no meet and greets tonight. Sorry. And I wrote back, oh, I don't need the meet and greet, but I'm not about to tell a bunch of kids with cancer who've been looking forward to this for a month that there's no meet and greet. So got to figure out how to make this happen. He's like, sorry, Drake's not doing it. Uh, so obviously I, uh, you know, call, I texted Drake's security guy and Drake's producer and I'm getting everybody involved. Like, you know, we can't do this. Can't let these kids down. This is, this gives them the ability to keep fighting for the next year. We can't let them down. We got to make this happen. And and basically, there there was a reason Drake didn't want to do it. I didn't think it was a good enough reason. He obviously did. But anyway, I figured I'm I'm Jewish. Drake's Jewish. Let me let me hit him where it hurts. I called his mom, and I said, Sandy, here's what. <laughs> oh, going on. you low blow. No, I know his mom. <laughs> so, Sandy, we got to make this happen. She says, I I got you seats. The seats are amazing. I said, I know, but these kids are looking forward to meeting Drake. We got to make it happen. She says. Let's see when we get to the show, but I it's not looking good today. There's a lot going on and whatever. Fine. I'm not going to let these kids know they're not meeting Drake because it will ruin their night. I yeah. figured, like, like you would, let's get there and we'll figure it out. Yeah. I get there and I see Will Smith backstage. I, I went myself backstage and left the kids there with the counselors and whatever. And I see Will Smith there. He says, hey, nice to see you again. That was so nice yesterday. He's raving about these kids who I brought on set and what a nice time it was and how much it meant to him and how good it made him feel. And I said, I actually have another group of kids here tonight. Why don't you come say hello? I would love to. I'll be over in five minutes. Tell me where you're sitting. He comes over. He hangs out with the kids, taking pictures with them. They're having a blast. I walk him back and I and I kind of whisper in his ear. I go, should we kick this up a notch? He goes, sure. What, what do you need? I go, let's take him after the show and meet Drake. He goes, that's amazing. So that's the art of making things happen. Well done. That is that is beautiful. For anyone that's listening to that, replay that and look at the infrastructure of that ask. Israel, I, I wrote your book. It's it's funny the stuff you're... Somehow, somewhere along the line, we got separated at birth. It's hysterical. I want to thank you very much for taking the time. How can people find out about what you're up to? Um, charitybids.com is our, is our website where we're basically from the start of COVID because the consignment business, you know, trips and experiences, yeah. which we were doing about 2000 events a year, uh, you know, came to a screeching halt at the beginning of COVID. We started producing, uh, virtual events. And now that COVID's over, uh, we're producing live events. So we kind of, our business kind of grew in a, in a huge way. So that's on the charity side. We're producing, you know, very, very creative, innovative, out of the box events, very high level, big events. Uh, we're getting back to the consignment now because people are traveling. So we're doing all the VIP experiences and travel around the world. We're doing virtual events. We're doing hybrid events. We're producing in-person events. Uh, but also during COVID, we, because of kind of what we were doing, the space we got into, I started a company called Virtually Everything. Uh, our website, I think, is virtuallye.com. And virtually everything is essentially the same idea, but we're doing, uh, we're doing, we're producing, writing and producing events for big corporations, uh, you know, pri high net worth, private families, you know, things like that. So we're both, you know, we, we spun out a whole new business out of this, but in the charity sector, we also grew tremendously as well in, in charity bits. So that's where you can find me. And uh, it was so great speaking to you. Thank you for having me on the show. And we should do this again sometime. Well, you guarantee we will, but it's got to be face to face. I could promise you that. The next Absolutely. time we meet, it'll be I, face to face. I can't keep up. I can't keep up with with your drinking, but <laughs> I think stories stories I could keep up with. Exactly. I'll drink. You talk. All right, Israel. Thank you very much, pal. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much. Have a great one.